So here, here goes, Brian, here goes my semi-formal introduction. Um, so I, how long ago, it must have been a year ago or more when we said, hey, let's, I'd love for you to come speak to uh, our, our students and the community here. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing uh, Brian Morgan for, I, I don't even know, 20 plus, 30 years, 20 years? It's almost 30 years. Yeah. 30 years. Um, we, so. as an undergrad, and then went through the MBA program when I was um, uh, a, a lowly professor and uh, enjoyed uh, all of that experience. And for those of you that have had uh, individuals that um, you've been uh, friends with for years, it's such a pleasure to see all the success that Brian has had. And he's been kind enough to keep in touch with me over the years. And I'm not sure what Brian is gonna talk about today, but I, I hope that he'll uh, be willing to take some questions about transitioning and moving from um, one opportunity to another. Um, Brian has been in leadership roles for AIG in the insurance industry, Willis, and now uh, Plexus, if I'm saying that correctly, Brian. That's correct. Um, and I hope I didn't leave out any stops along the way, but um, it's, been, um, it's been really interesting to see and informative to have Brian back into the classroom and to talk about leadership and um, managing the corporate environment. Uh, you, you can't have a career that has had, I, I think, as, as many opportunities to grow. Um, and I, I'd love to hear Brian's perspective on uh, AIG at some point today as well and that whole transition during the financial collapse. And uh, so it's real interesting to me to every time I get together with Brian. So we appreciate uh, your presence here today. And I think you have just finished a term or are you still serving as chair for the, the uh, senior board for the college? I uh, just rotated out. Just so rotated. Brian gives back repeatedly to Clemson. And I think it's fair to say his blood runs a little bit orange particularly yeah. during football season. A lot of so, Brian, I'll turn it over to you. No, that's great. And thanks, Greg. And, and I have to say it's been uh, one of the neater things is the relationship that you and I have had over the years, you know, starting from just coming in as a freshman at Clemson. But uh, you've been, you know, sort of there as you know, I've gone throughout, you know, the, the last 25 years from a career perspective. And I could say that I'll tell, share with everybody here in my uh, – I'll never forget in uh, what was it marketing 450, uh, my first uh, paper that I got back. I think Greg had to buy a new red uh, pen after that because that it was basically all red pen. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's been exciting. Um, and I'll just start sort of foundational. Um, one, you know, obviously went to Clemson uh, undergrad in marketing. Uh, did my MBA after I graduated. I uh, actually got into the industry that I'm in right now because of an internship uh, my junior year uh, with a company called Marsh & McLennan. Uh, some of y'all might be familiar with Marsh, uh, but they are the largest insurance broker globally. Um, had you know, really worked there for 10 years, started out on the business development sales side in Greenville, and then realized pretty quickly uh, from a career standpoint that if you wanted to grow in a large corporation, you needed to be able to uh, sort of go upward into leadership or management. So took over the role as a sales leader for the state of Tennessee, moved to Memphis, uh, which I didn't really see myself moving to Memphis. And my wife was like, I, I was like, hey, it's, you know, land of Elvis, great barbecue, let's go. Uh, so he just picked up and moved uh, over there, not really knowing anybody, but it was a great, great, it, you know, I have to say from a standpoint of taking something on that was uh, a good challenge, it definitely definitely was. They lied about my age. They said I was actually 29, but I was really 26. Um, and, uh, you know, most of the folks, that was after an acquisition that Marsh did of a company called Sedwick James. And that was their North American headquarters where they had 300 associates and roughly, and nobody else from Marsh was actually put there except for me. So 
I was sort of the enemy at the gates, I guess you could say, post acquisition. So I learned a lot about uh, uh, integration of, of cultures uh, and also sort of seeing what it feels like to actually be purchased, you know, in, in a group that you know, how that feels. Um, so basically, fast forward, uh, did that role for a period of time. And then right as the Elliott Spitzer investigations took place, uh, it really sort of rocked our industry. Well, actually, I'll back up a little bit to September 11th. Uh, you know, obviously, a, just a, a tragic day, but was one that also taught me quite a few lessons from leadership. Um, unfortunately, Marsh at the time, we lost almost 200 associates, uh, which was very impactful as an organization. Um, and, and then sort of see, to see sort of how that impacted the overall company and the culture as we move forward. Uh, then you do fast forward into 2004 and Elliot Spitzer basically decided that he was going to focus on the insurance brokerage and the insurance marketplace in general uh, with a thing called contingent commissions. Um, some of you may or may not be familiar with this, but really it was a, it, another learning lesson uh, where our CEO at the time basically dismissed him and would not meet with him. And then that resulted in our whole industry being completely turned upside down on its head. Uh, where it could have been easily avoided. So resulted in billions and billions of dollars paid out uh, by various companies. But the reason why that crisis sort of created an opportunity for me personally was um, Willis at the time, Joe Plumeria, our chairman and CEO, who, who now works for KKR, um, he, he actually was a pretty dynamic individual because he had been through a similar scenario with Elliot Spitzer uh, when he actually ran uh, Smith Barney, Solomon Smith Barney, so uh, related to retirement funds. But uh, anyway, so we, you know, when that hit, he actually, I was recruited by Willis to come over and become CEO of Willis of Tennessee, uh, which basically had about 900 associates and was really the former headquarters uh, for Willis uh, uh, based in Nashville. So. That was an interesting scenario because again, I think I was 32 at the time and uh, it, it was a, a great opportunity, but I have to say one of my, my things that I tell everybody is it's great to take a job where you feel like you're actually stretched, that you know it's the job sort of bigger than where you are from a skill standpoint. Um, and that was one that was truly that, you know, sort of that scenario. The fortunate part was, was I had some great leaders uh, that I was able to work with a gentleman by the name of Vic Krause, um, who's now since retired, but uh, Vic, you know, ended up becoming the CEO of North America. And then Joe Plumeri, you know, was great because he basically took me on and mentored me. So uh, he, he, I'll never forget when I took the job, he said, I'm going to teach you how to run any company, not just an insurance broker, but I'll give you the fundamentals of how to do that. So he did that, uh, really impactful, great opportunity, had some good success uh, in us building you know, our Tennessee operations. And then you know, basically to your point about the financial crisis uh, that occurred in 2008, I was um, basically presented with the opportunity. We did a, an acquisition. The one thing I can say is if you're moving into a financial, uh, a financial crisis that we did in 2008, you don't want to do a $2 billion acquisition. So Joe had gone out and we bought a company called HRH based out of Richmond, Virginia. And it was basically a $2 billion acquisition. Um, and we had to do a bridge loan once we closed it uh, with Goldman Sachs, which I'm sure Goldman loved us because we were paying them 20% on a $2 billion loan. Uh, so that was a pretty interesting experience. Uh, I got a phone call. I, I can remember it like yesterday and they were like, Hey, uh, you've done a great job in Tennessee. So we want you to move to Atlanta and integrate seven operations. Uh, and by the way, can you be there next week? So we actually picked up the family and moved in two weeks to Atlanta, uh, in the middle of 2008 in the crisis, but it was a great experience. But again, you know, it was just sort of a pivoting moment. Uh, and I think what I would say is in each one of these, uh, experiences from a career standpoint, I was gaining more and more insights and some, you know, different uh, skill sets, I think, you know, that really helped me as we get to where, where we are today. So came down, did that for six years. Uh, that was a really interesting experience to go through and sort of watch, you know, because when I joined Willis, we were about 400 million in the U.S. When I left in the U.S., we were close to two and a half billion dollars. And that was basically over a 10 year period. 
uh, a lot of things changed. Uh, obviously, with the, a big acquisition like that and a tough time, there was a lot of pressure put around uh, expenses and controls and so forth. But both, both Marsh and Willis were great experiences and sort of led me up to, you know, after that, I realized, okay, I'd like to get on the private side. I've done the public company thing. I'd like to try something a little bit different. So uh, there was a firm that was actually created by the name of Integro. Um, and it was built uh, by a gentleman that actually had started Ace Insurance Company, which is now Chubb. He also you know, created Excel. Felt like he could, uh, you know, it was the largest startup in the industry. And it was basically, they, I think it was a $350 million startup from scratch. Um, and it was an interesting scenario because I'd always watched the company from afar and they hired some, basically they went out and hired the best technical talent in the industry. And, uh, but they didn't hire any salespeople. They, they decided, they thought that the premise was because they were so talented that all the business would come to them. And it really, uh, it worked okay at the start, but then it started to stall out. Um, and so then I went over to Integra. They recruited me to come over and really sort of drop strategy and start to bring the organization together, uh, as well as looking at acquisitions. So we, we did about 42 acquisitions. We took the company from roughly, when I got there, it was like 60 million in the US. Uh, we, when we sold it, it was 152 million over a four year period. So it was a good, it was a great experience. I learned a lot. Um, and that was a private equity backed uh, venture. So I found myself spending a lot of time back and forth to New York, uh, sitting in the boardroom with the PE fund. Um, and, you know, it was sort of bittersweet, you know, that we, we had had the success and sort of turned that story around. Uh, but I, I would also say that it, it was a little, it was a little unnerving and strange to go through the actual sale process. So there, you know, once we distinguished that that made sense, you know, I think I sat on a plane for about a month straight and I didn't know which city I'd be going to, to talk to potential acquirers of the firm. And of course you're still running your daily business, but it's sort of, it's challenging because nobody, you know, you keep it really sort of quiet. Um, but it was a great experience to, to sort of go through and see what that looks like to sell uh, an organization. But it also opened up my eyes to the true ability to drive value uh, creation within an organization and how you can sort of impact that from a leadership standpoint. So once we were acquired by Epic Insurance Brokers, which actually just got bought by Carlisle as, as well, um, I knew that, you know, when I looked around the room, um, there were a lot of chiefs <laughs> and, and having uh, understood that once you get bought, you really, you know, it's, you, you, you don't really control your own destiny anymore. So the world was, you know, I, I call it when you start to feel the ground shake, sort of like an earthquake in the business world, if you start to feel something that it's sort of going to be that way. So we, we decided jointly to part ways. Um, and it was the first time in my career that I'd had, actually had an opportunity to just say, okay, I'm going to step back from all of this and really say, okay, what is it I want to go do? I mean, I, I feel like it's all built up to something. So uh, that's where Greg and I got together and, you know, really spent time talking to different contacts. I actually took the approach that um, I wanted to get this right. I really wanted to make sure at this point in my career, at the time, I, you know, 46 years old, um, I wanted to really just sort of take my time and figure it out. And fortunately, I had that ability to do that. So sort of set my own time limit on it. I wanted to figure it out over a 90 day period. Most people I think were like, hey, you're gonna get some time to just hang out at home, uh, you know, chill. I think I actually worked harder from the time I broke that, you know, relationship with my former employer than I've ever worked in my life because I wanted to explore everything I possibly could. So I uh, really looked at it it, it, it first and said, okay, I'm going to go out and talk, you know, cause I had built a lot of contacts at different firms across the country and around the world. So I really, I had a list of probably 20 different firms that I was talking to I actually had serious discussions with 12 firms, a uh, vast array from publicly traded to private equity backed. And I kept, you know, and the other thing that happened that was interesting is I had, three private equity funds approached me, you know, and they were looking to invest anywhere from 200 to 250 million to start a broker and go buy stuff, which sounded pretty cool. Um, and I have to say, like, I, I have a lot of appreciation. I really liked the PE fund that we worked with when I was at Integro. 
But I also realized that you're basically creating all this value for the PE investors versus, you know, holding the value within the firm. So I had this dream that like, I wanted to create this fiercely independent uh, brokerage firm because we've had so much consolidation in our industry. Just last year alone, there were 627 uh, actual acquisitions done in the insurance agent or broker space. So what I really, uh, you know, what I wanted to do was actually create uh, a, a company that was truly private that held it, you know, that basically had the shareholders were all within the firm. So a little different model that, that was out there, but I felt like it would be appealing or attractive potentially to some sellers because really at this point in our, in our industry, most of the multiples are going at anywhere from 12 to 14 times in some instances, 15 times EBITDA, which is insane. Uh, but it's because, you know, the PE funds have found that they like it so much and the large public brokers, they get a natural spread from where they're actually trading, you know, their share value. Uh, they pick up, you know, they know that they can you know, pick up plenty of uh, return on the arbitrage. So it's a real, it, 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 you know, buyers, if, if a buyer or seller right now in our space is looking to go somewhere where they want to be a part of it, a seat at the table and they don't want to just exit, that was really what I was, my vision was. So how was I going to do that with no private equity money? Because uh, I wasn't going to go down the PE side. Um, so it was like, okay, well, I need to find somebody. So I really leaned into my network. Um, and fortunately I had come up, you know, I'd worked with the gentleman that was in charge of the property and casualty group for the Plexus group. And he said, Hey, why don't you just have a conversation with our owner? So it was pretty humorous. Cause I just called him up out of the blue. I'm like, Hey, Walt, I think you need to talk to me. He's like, who, who are you? Where, like, where did you come from? Uh, I'm like, I have this you know, vision, this plan of what I think we can go build. And uh, I think we just need to sit down and, you know, I'd love to come on board and, and sort of lead the organization to, to go do this. So after I think he initially was like, okay, I, I don't know what, this is like so different, you know, cause he basically at the time had a, a, a $25 million agency in Chicago with an office in Oklahoma city and Dallas. And, and so we, um, we actually hit it off. He sort of saw the vision uh, of what, you know, I felt like we would like to go do. And so it's been a year now and uh, came on board. We've opened up uh, an operation in Los Angeles. We've got a sports entertainment and cannabis group that we built, built out there. We have a private equity vertical that we built as well. Um, we also uh, did a, a recently, we just did two acquisitions in Tampa uh, around the personal lawns and the homeowners associations area. So we really, it's been fun because we've taken the approach that we want to be a specialty you know, player. We're not going to be all things to all people, but he had built an, a phenomenal company uh, over a 30 year period. And I, I think he, when we got together, he's like, I don't, you know, I want to take it to the next level. And that's really what we, you know, that's what we joined hands. And so let's go do it. And we've been very fortunate because we've attracted a lot of great talent um, across the U S and, and we've really created more of a national footprint. And, you know, we, you know, in the world that we're in right now, and I feel bad sometimes saying this because so many people have had such difficult times through COVID, we sort of decided, a lot of our competitors decided to hit the brakes and sort of sit tight. Um, we were in a zero debt situation. Uh, we were carrying no debt. So I said, let's push the gas pedal in COVID. And so we did some acquisitions. We've invested in our sales force. Uh, we actually, I think it, you know, we just went, we hit the gas uh, and it's been a lot of fun to sort of see. So, you know, I think our expectations will probably finish this year north of 30 million. We've got a solid pipeline of acquisitions with people that sort of view the world the way that we do, because we want to remain fiercely independent. And uh, hopefully we'll be up to 50 million within the next 24 months. And then, you know, it, it's not really so much about the revenue as it is just building a dynamic culture. And that's really what was so important to me is to find a firm that had just a really dynamic culture. Um, and he built that over 30 years. So, you know, that's the piece that I think has been something like when people, when we talk to people, um, whether it be prospective hires or whether it be prospective acquisitions, I think that that's really become a differentiator for us, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes people like to get the extra two, two times on a deal uh, versus, you know, where we would be, because we're not going to pay quite as much, but, 
So that's just, uh, I think, a little bit of my story uh, from a standpoint of transition. What I would say, uh, just some you know, takeaways, is if you are going into a, a transition, is one, be self-aware. I think it's really important to sort of know who, who you are, what your strengths are, and sort of what your value proposition is. Um, and, and just own it. I mean, I think a lot of times people go into interviews or they go into th these scenarios and it's more of a, let me just go do whatever I can do to get paid. Uh, and I get that, but I think, you know, you get to the sort of this point in a career, I think it's important to really step back and say, where do I really want to be? Uh, and how do I, you know, what does that look like? The next thing I would say is be humble. Um, that was like to, to sort of part ways with Epic uh, after the acquisition, it was a little bit of a, a, a shock to the system, like, you know, in a way to say, wow, I, you know, this just didn't fit. Uh, and, and in a way that they, they didn't want me, which is fine. Uh, but I, I think it was a very humbling experience uh, that to, to really, I think for me, when you find something you enjoy doing, you, you really should appreciate it. And I think sometimes I, I think throughout my career, I sort of lost sight of, how you know how much i should appreciate exactly what was in front of me um and then you know i think ultimately is believe in yourself i mean i think as much as you it, it's it's safe to say that you know as much as you know your background you know your skills and everything i think ultimately when you sort of go through a transition you i think that's the piece that i see when people are transitioning is that you got to believe in you got to believe in yourself and and i think that that's a key and then the last thing is leverage your network. Leverage your network. Um, I've been fortunate. I've been a pretty active user on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I have a pretty solid network out there. And you know, to me, I, I think building a, a network not just you know it sort of starts I think local, but in today's environment, you really can build a network around the world. Um, and that's been something that's been very beneficial for me as well. So with that, I'm going to check my thing here and see what questions that we've got. Greg, did you have anything for me before I start? Uh, I, I've got one other piece that I'd like for you to, you know, this is, so what I asked Brian when we talked a year ago, it's just interesting to know in corporate America that it's, you're highly unlikely to remain at the same place your entire career, as you guys already know, I'm sure. But wouldn't it be interesting to kind of talk about the transitions and those kinds of things. But the other piece that I, I would love, Brian, for you to take just a second and address are just some key leadership principles that have gone with you from one position to another, but things that you feel strongly about um, in terms of your leadership style and what's important to uh, kind of set the table for all of us in terms of just some thought provoking key principles of leadership. No, I, I appreciate that. That's a, a great point, Greg. Uh, I, I think the first thing I would say is sort of getting back to be true to yourself is if you, if you find yourself in a company or a corporate culture that you feel like you're a different person at work than you are with your friends or outside of work, then eventually that's going to catch up. I mean, cause it's just, that's not the right place to be. So I, I like, I think what my, one of the things from a leadership standpoint is I really like to set a culture or a group and have people that work with me in a real atmosphere, whether it's good stuff or bad stuff. I mean, a lot of times people in, I think the corporate setting like to just hear good news. Um, I, I like to sort of set the tone with our team that whether it's good or bad, uh, I'd rather just know and we'll figure it out together. And I think, you know, and I think that goes with, you know, creating an environment with after action reviews where you can sort of sit down and be real with each other. The other part of it is, is treat people like the way you would like to be treated. Um, you know, and, and I've, I've been fortunate that I've seen really good leadership and I've seen, I've seen really bad leadership and really bad leadership becomes toxic. And eventually it's, it's almost like, unfortunately like a cancer and it will ruin an organization. And unfortunately, you know, I think from my standpoint is if you create the right environment and people feel like they're a part of something, that that's, that's a critical component. And the other part, I, you know, especially today, because I, I work with so many different companies and I've worked with so many different companies over the years, I, 
you can almost feel it when you walk through the doors, what that culture feels like. And I, I think that that to me, you know, if you go back to the book, Good to Great, which is pretty interesting these days, because if you look at a lot of those companies, they lost their way too, uh, that were featured in that book. Uh, but again, I, I think treat, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated. And then ultimately, I think if you're making decisions, whether it's hiring or firing people, just own it. I mean, I, I, and I think being upfront with people from that perspective. Uh, uh, Joe Plumeri, one of, one of the things that he told me that always impacted me from a leadership perspective was when you do layoffs, it, it's a terrible thing, but what layoffs really are, are another word for terrible management and terrible leadership. And, and it always stuck with me. Like that's the one thing I never want to have to deal with because I would have failed our team. Uh, and that's the way I approach my job is, is whether it be assessing risk, whether it be our financial discipline, my job is like not, I, I just don't ever, I, I feel like that's ultimately when you know you failed uh, as a leader. And um, let me see, I, I think the, the last piece that I find really interesting is what you all are doing is never stop investing in, in learning. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of times people get to the point where they think they know everything and that's a dangerous spot. So I, I, I find that I, I really, especially as I've gotten older, I find learning from every, you know, everybody is, is really important. I think the more you got to continue to invest in, in sort of developing yourself, um, both I think from a mental aptitude uh, and the other part I would say is the physical aspect, because a lot of times people don't realize the rigors of business, the travel and everything else. And if you don't take care of your body, then you're going to not, you're not doing it yourself any favors because uh, it will catch up to you. But yeah, that's just, I, ho I hope that's sort of what you were looking for. So uh, Stephanie asked, what year did I graduate in marketing? That would be 1995, uh, which was our heyday at the Clemson marketing department, right, Greg? Uh, that, those so, were the days, that's for sure. Those were the days, for sure. Uh, from Jack Sterling, a uh, few questions. What have you seen in terms of cybersecurity demand from the cannabis industry? Uh, what risks do most businesses overlook? And do you see ever see a firm's insurance premiums reduced as a result of specific security controls being in place? Uh, great question. So first, uh, yes, it, cyber, you know, cybersecurity, basically insurance for the cannabis industry is very unique, uh, first and foremost, uh, because the industry started by not buying insurance because they couldn't buy insurance. So now it's evolving. Um, there are probably three or four MGAs out there, which are managing general agents where you can actually put programs together for some cannabis related risks. Uh, it's still developing, but I, yeah, I think on the cybersecurity side, definitely uh, there, there's risk related to that, but it's, it's, it's continuing to unfold. Um, I think the next question, what risks do most businesses overlook? And I'm happy to, if you have more questions on the cybersecurity for Canvas, I can put you in touch with our practice leader. He, he's in that space all the time. He's out in Los Angeles. Um, what risks do most businesses overlook? Uh, well, I, I think we can all say that everybody overlooked pandemic, uh, which was actually always in the top 10 risks. Uh, if you look at any report that was published over the past 15 to 20 years related to enterprise risk management, uh, it was always listed in the top 10 as potential risks. Uh, there were only a couple of facilities that were actually out there that would write that risk. Um, they were London-based facilities. Um, I, I don't know if many people noticed, but the one group that did actually buy pandemic insurance was Wimbledon, uh, and they had their claim paid out for $32 million. And over the period of 20 years, they had spent, I think, maybe $16 million in premium. So, but, you know, I think, I think the pandemic was obviously one that's overlooked. And then I, I think the, the other thing in our industry, what I find with, is that by nature, people are trained to think about insurance as a commodity or a transaction. 
And I think a lot of times they overlook from a finance perspective, uh, the actual ability to prevent most of it. So whether it be contractual, contractual risk management or mitigation techniques, are the ability to also just go a little bit deeper and look at how do we prevent the losses from occurring. So I think, um, I think that that's an area where if people, you know, as companies grow and evolve, at first you just get insurance because you need it. In reality, you really should look at insurance as a company gets bigger is basically risk financing. So I look at it, I look at the insurance marketplace no different than the banking marketplace. So basically you're just using a carrier's risk capital. And if you sort of are able to sort of do that and start to objectively view risk on a, a, a different basis than just traditionally saying, oh, I need a worker's comp policy. I'm gonna go get general liability. Is to really step back and say, okay, what does this mean? What's my cost of capital? Does it make more sense for me to actually retain more risk? Where do we feel comfortable retaining it or where do we wanna pass it off? But that's a really good question. Um, the do I ever see a firm's insurance premiums reduced as a result of specific uh, controls being in place? Yeah, I'll give you an example of one that we're working on right now that I'm really excited about. Uh, and this is something that we've we've helped develop. Um, there's a gentleman, Jared Pope, he, he runs, he's the CEO and founder of a company called WorkShield. Uh, and his time has been pretty good. He basically what he's done is he's created a third party that companies can use uh, to actually help mitigate, uh, but also resolve any type of Me Too claims uh, from sexual you know, harassment to discrimination, uh, which, you know, it's pretty revolutionary, but it's actually a proactive measure um, that companies can actually utilize this resource. In turn, the intent would be on your employment practices, liability, your DNO, it protects you there, but moreover, I like to, I'm really passionate about this because it protects everybody that works there. So if, you know, cause oftentimes, you know, if people have a, a claim, they're going to have to go to the HR manager or their manager, 65% of the time, the person that's actually harassing somebody is typically the manager. So, you know, that's just an area where to your point, there are different mitigations and you know, tools out there that companies can deploy to help reduce that. Okay. And I, I got to pick it up. Sorry. Um, what lessons have you learned about uh, integrating disparate businesses, cultures, and tech after an acquisition or merger? That's a great question. Um, so the one thing I did learn is I never want to buy a firm that is a roll up, a firm of entities that have been acquired that never were integrated. Because basically uh, we bought, uh, when Willis bought HRH, it was basically a roll up of 120 agencies and there was no centralization whatsoever. So you go from a highly organized, highly centralized company buying a culture that's completely disparate over there. It was challenging. So I, I'm, I'm very leery of things that have not been at least to some level assimilated or have you know, good levels of business controls. What that does on a culture is basically, I, I think you, from my perspective, if you've create, if you've gone out and created a roll up, and you haven't built a culture there, a, a consistent culture, then it's basically sort of an amoeba. I mean, it's just sort of, you, you, you can feel it. There has to be a commanding control in an acquisition. So a culture has to be able to be existent in an organization. Once you acquire it, you can adjust it to a, a, an ongoing one. But that's, that's really where I've found that most things fail. Um, at Integra, when we did the 42 acquisitions, uh, they started out with no rhyme or reason. Strategically, it was a little bit before I got there. And, and they really hadn't, they didn't do a lot of integration. So you let things sit there for, like if you buy something, you just let it sit there for a year or two and you don't have a real plan on how you're gonna actually drive uh, value creation from it, which does happen a lot. People are just buying revenue that becomes an issue too, because then you're going back and you're trying to pull it back in. And then really, uh, you know, there was a lot of rework. And unfortunately you basically, from my perspective, you, you're basically losing out on the money you pay. I mean, yeah, you can buy something in our industry and you know, you're going to turn, you know, probably get two to four off of it. But if you actually create it strategically and how that fits in, 
you, I mean, you can blow the roof off, which is exciting. That's the, that's sort of the one thing I would take from that. And then the other part is the first, I think the first 30 days of an acquisition, it's almost like a, a new job that you start, you know, an employee is going to decide if they're going to stay somewhere long-term in the first 30 days. An acquisition should feel is the same thing. So when we bought, you know, for example, the, the acquisition we did at Tampa, even though it was, you know, we were on the plane, our team went in, we wanted to make them feel like a part of the family as soon as it, it happened. And, uh, and I think that makes a big difference. Uh, you know, I think that the, long, the more you get out in front of it, the better. Um, and also too, if you can't, if you can't articulate your, your team or your associates, why you're doing an acquisition, you probably should be doing an acquisition if you can't, you know, let them understand how that fits. Uh, which is interesting right now because actually Aon is acquiring Willis Towers Watson. It's a pretty big deal. I think I've heard the breakup fee is a billion dollars and they're going to, the transaction is supposed to close next year. All those associates have known about this acquisition for a year and a half now. It'll be a year and a half before it closes. I, I can only tell you that there's a lot, a, a lot of stress, I'm sure, on both sides for that organization. Okay. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, what parallels, if any, do you see looking back at 9-11 and so far with what we experienced in COVID? Um, you know, I, I have to say that the, the one thing that was striking to me is because I actually flew two days after September 11th. And I think I might have been like when I went into Hartsfield to fly out, uh, during COVID that, you know, the monitors in Terminal T, if you all know Atlanta Hartsfield well, there's typically like 20 monitors and all the flights, you can see all the flights there. It was weird because it reminded me of flying after that because I walked in and there's only one monitor with four flights on it. And it was just really weird. I mean, and I, and I think that whole experience of just sort of traveling, it was uh, very similar uh, in the sense that people like, sort of look at each other funny. Um, I think you're much, you know, heightened, heightened level of self-awareness of like really what, you know, your surroundings and what's going on. Uh, I would say that those are probably some of the parallels uh, that I noticed. And I think the other thing, and I have to give Delta credit, I think Delta's done a really good job uh, as far as how they've, they've tried to handle this. Uh, and, you know, I, I I actually feel safer. On, I felt safer over the past month on the plane than I did in the airports. So, um, the other thing I would say about September 11th is disheartening and horrible and tragic as it was. I felt like it brought the country together. I'm not going to get political on this, but I, unfortunately, I feel like COVID is pushing us in a, a lot of bad spots. Um, I feel like we saw the best and 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 people, you know, as a group, uh, post September 11th, I can only hope that we we push through this COVID thing and we become stronger as a country. Um, and there's a sense of pride, you know, that we 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 can prevail because it's it's scary. I think the other part is we knew with September 11th that we could financially withstand that. Uh, the other thing I would say is insurance pay, played a pretty big role uh, related to that. The towers actually were on a Willis form. Uh, and that actually sort of a historic claim as far as how, whether that was going to be considered one or two occurrences, uh, not to get into minutia, but that's one of those things, you know, where risk really does play a big factor. But I think as a country, we knew we would withstand that from a financial perspective. I think COVID, it's just, it's continued on so much that I think it's taken its toll uh, on individuals as well. Um, and I think it's, but it's also created an enormous amount of opportunity and it's also created a whole new set of risks uh, with people working from home. If you think about it, I'm sure everybody's got their uh, workstation set up ergonomically designed. So you don't end up, end up with carpal tunnel. We're gonna see more workers comp claims from that. We are not worried about auto claims. That's why the carriers are given, you know, were given rebates out because nobody was driving. If you really think about it, we probably shouldn't have paid anything. <laughs> so, but it's, it, it's, it's an amazing dynamic on our end to sort of see all the different things that are taking place, but it's gonna create new opportunity as well as new risks. Um, 
Next question is one thing class is currently working on with info systems is that today's climate, you simply can't stop learning. How true is that? How prevalent that was in today's environment uh, that you're always learning more and more about your field and don't really have a luxury of a stopping point. Yeah, I, I got to tell you to stay relevant, you gotta, you gotta stay at the tip of the spear. Uh, and I think that goes whether you're in, in leadership or anywhere. I mean, I think today there's so much information out there uh, that it's very important to continue to learn. Uh, la, la, la. Can I share a time that you had to give challenging feedback to an employee and how you maintain a good working relationship with them? So I think I've had to terminate, I think it's 162 associates over my career. Um, I've probably hired close to, I think, over 600 people. I hate terminations. I absolutely, it, it, I can't sleep. I mean, it just bothers me. Even if it's a situation where the person clearly has either been out of bounds or not performed at a level uh, that they wanted to. I think for me, uh, what I would say is, is if uh, people talk about performance reviews all the time, like, and like you got these annual reviews, I have a different philosophy here. I think every day should be a, a back and forth review. If you ever sit down in a, in a review with a, an associate and they don't know where they are, if you're going to have a, a negative conversation about their performance, sort of, I say shame on me. If I, I if I haven't been talking to you and telling you straight up like where you are, what you need to do, uh, both good or bad, then it should be a constant process. I, I think the the concept of annual reviews is is somewhat flawed. Uh, I think it's a it, a way for people almost to be. It's almost like Festivus. For those of you that ever watched Seinfeld, where you air your grievances, I mean, I think some managers actually use it a way to, you know, oh, I got the, I got this performance review, so I can actually now just tell them all the things that I don't like. I, I think it's got to be a constant flowing uh, process. So uh, that's a good question. But as long as you, as long as you always know that you, you've taken the time and you have fundamental facts in giving you know, tough feedback to somebody. Where I found the toughest situations is where I maybe wasn't totally informed, uh, and, and that was, that's on me uh, as far as if I, if I didn't have all the information. Uh, next question, what do I look for in a good leader? Honesty and integrity, that's it. That's the foundational part. Uh, you can't build an effective team as a leader if people don't trust you and working with other leaders, you got to be able to trust one another. And I think it starts with that core of, of your actual integrity. And that's just basically people that when I line up on the field, I want to know that every single leader that I work with or works within the organization, that they're going to make, uh, they're going to make the best decision uh, based off of what's right. Uh, what is my perspective or how has your view changed on PE firms and how to differentiate groups that pump and dump versus firms trying to build fundamentals with a long-term growth vision, especially within the financial instrument space? That's a great question. Um, I think the first and foremost, you just got to look at the track record. I mean, I think if, if you look at funds that are willing to stay in an investment for five to seven years, it's going to have a, a healthier cycle. Um, our industry has been really somewhat decimated from a cultural standpoint because of the pump and dump um, that you, know, you allude to. You know, it's basically three years. It's like a, a three-year horizon and they're out. Um, you can't build a, a culture with a you know, three, 36 month window. And what happens is they go from one fund to the other fund. And in a lot of these instances, each fund has their own sort of like playbook. And so the playbook actually is changing the underlying culture. Uh, and typically you see a lot of changes within the leadership infrastructure as well. But yeah, I think there are some really great PE firms out there that take a longer term approach as well as I think the other thing that's getting pretty active is, uh, is basically family offices. Um, I think do a really good job of just injecting the capital and basically staying, you know, letting the business run itself. Uh, what is your opinion of the right amount of cybersecurity due to diligence on a potential actual 
acquisition. Um, cybersecurity. Well, I can tell you that like our industry, there's a lot of phishing going on. There's been some significant uh, actual scenarios where cyber security has been a, a big issue. You know, what I was excited because this, our firm, Plexus Group, you know, we're, we're cloud-based. Uh, we've gone through sort of how we, we operate everything and all of our security measures. But I would say that that is a very big issue, especially in the financial, you know, our, our sector. Um, I've dealt with throughout my career, and this is public knowledge. Um, when I was at Willis, we, we had, I guess we had a data, we had a data loss in India where they had backup tapes and a guy got on a bus with the backup tapes and left them on the bus. Uh, that resulted in a $22 million claim. Uh, for reporting for almost, I, I can't even remember how many millions of people that were, it was all their employee benefits data. So yeah, yeah, that that's, you know, to me, I think it's, you can't underscore that from a due diligence standpoint. Um, best insurance company across the board. Uh, that's a good question. It, it depends on, again, if you're looking for a firm, you know, bigger is not always better. Uh, is what I would say, especially in insurance. Uh, but I think a, a firm that has the ability, you know, there's a few firms out there that have the ability to, to, to do a vast array of, uh, of, of different risk. I mean, Chubb being one of those, uh, they've got good leadership at Chubb, um, uh, you know, at all different levels. I think they do a nice job. Um, obviously you got travelers. I mean, there's, but then I have to say there's other companies that are more regional type players like the Cincinnati insurance companies. They're great for claims. They take care of their clients. They do a wonderful job. They have a very unique distribution model with their uh, insurance agents. So it, it's sort of, it depends on what you're really looking for, but there, there's definitely uh, other firms that I would say that do an incredible job of really partnering with us and the client. And I think in a perfect world, if you can set up a, a relationship um, with your broker, with the carriers, it makes a big difference. A lot of times people just don't even take the time to meet their carriers. And again, I go back to your insurance is basically risk capital. If you're going to go and get funding and put together some type of debt facility for your company, you're going to spend talk to those banks on a regular basis. So it should be the same way on the insurance. Um, let's see, I uh, mentioned the toxicity of bad leadership and also the importance of aligning your personal self with your organization's culture. If you believe in align with the overall mission and the spirit of an organization, but the leadership is damaged, damaging that resulting in layoffs, poor productivity, Etc. Do you feel it's possible to stay committed with the organization, or do you exit based on leadership direction alone? Uh, that's a good question. I, I personally feel like if you don't feel if you if the leadership at the top doesn't set the right tone, it's time to go. If it it doesn't align with what you're looking to do, uh, unless you know that there's some type of change that's going to be imminent. Um, unfortunately, I've had an experience working with a what I would call a terrible leader. Uh, that was not class, call it classically trained, and he was ego tripping and power tripping, and it, it resulted in just uh, a really toxic scenario. So I, I think if you see that, and if you you fundamentally believe that there there is a deficiency there, I would probably suggest go ahead and look for another place to work. Um, Excel access versus organic databases and massive ERPs when it comes to data extraction, which platforms do you see the most? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think from our standpoint, you know, we do a lot of uh, consulting. We have a technology services group that does a lot of Ben Admin consulting where we help our clients, uh, whether it be payroll or Ben Admin. There are a lot of different uh, systems out there. Uh, I, I personally, I. I don't really use Excel or Access that much. I mean, we run everything from a sales and business development and marketing perspective through a firm called HubSpot, which is sort of a, a you know one of our core components. And then we have agency management systems that we actually operate everything else with. Uh, relative. Um, 
um, have you gotten, have you not gotten right sometimes and did it have significant consequences? How did you bounce back? Not really sure. I mean, I can tell you this, I'm, <laughs> I've been wrong many times. Uh, and, and I think my, my whole message there from a leadership standpoint is if you do something and you, it doesn't feel right, fail fast, uh, rip the bandaid off. And, you know, from an ego standpoint, just own it. I mean, I, I think a lot of times people have a tendency that they feel like there's so much pressure for an investment or uh, uh, something that it needs to be, you know, it, it, you gotta, it's gotta work. Um, I, I think if it's not going to work, you just, you just move on. And that, and that's really the way I, with our team the, that I approach things too. Um, if something's just not working, let's call it what it is. It's okay if we messed up um, and let's just change, you know, course correct quickly. So Brian, we've got uh, a few more minutes, maybe answer if there is another question that sounds interesting, let's do that. And then, maybe have you just uh, offer some closing comments, just um, something that might be helpful as our students go back to their corporate environments and we'll, we'll call it a, a, a solid and very interesting hour with you. Oh, uh, yeah, so I, I, one last question and I'll give you my thoughts. Uh, one is best CRM system. Obviously, I think everybody, you know, Salesforce is a great tool. I think it's a little expensive. I think for the money, pound for pound, and if you're trying to use it to deploy, I think, really savvy, uh, you know, sales and marketing campaigns, I'm a big fan of HubSpot. I, I, I find HubSpot to be relatively affordable, and I, I like the way it can pivot. And if you're, if you're trying to, like, we actually had made a change to HubSpot prior to COVID, and I can directly say that we probably generated – over a million dollars of revenue because we had the system in place and it was being optimized and fully uh, utilized. We actually work with an outside inbound marketing firm out of Milwaukee called Acility. Uh, the lady that runs it, Jackie, is dynamic. Found her. I actually just watched her podcast on LinkedIn and I picked up the phone and said, listen, I, I'd love to get some help. And she's like, well, as it turns out, I used to be the head of marketing for a company called Zywave. Which is a uh, which supports insurance agents and brokers. So she knew what we were, you know, what we do, and I I have to say that making that adjustment and sort of leaning in to to get to utilize our CRM system, it, we would have really been at a detriment had we not uh, going through COVID. Um, I guess my last takeaways is I think what I would say from a leadership perspective is right now is a critical time. Um, I think. Is, is, you know, I think communication is critical. Uh, we went, you know, we went to a, I think a higher level of communication throughout our firm um, in different forms, but I think people need to see leadership uh, in times of difficulty. I think uh, this is really a, a, the most important time, in my opinion, as a business leader to step up and I think to, to really empathize um, and understand what everybody's going through. It's very dynamic. Uh, I mean, obviously a lot of the you know, public schools are being closed in, in different parts of the country. So I've got a lot of my associates that are dealing with what am I gonna do for childcare? Um, I think now's the time too to be understanding, um, but you know, I think individual discipline, um, I think, but ultimately it's, it, this is the time where I think people are gonna shine or people are, are going to be exposed as let's just call it what it is pretenders. All right. Well, um, my friend, it's been too long. We need to get together and have a beer sometime. I appreciate as always your willingness to give back to our Clemson students and your insights, Brian, and I'll show you how good I'm getting on zoom. There you go. And clap. <laughs> All right. Appreciate so, it. This is great questions from the group. Uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, good luck to everybody and, and go Tigers.